Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is Tri-Cities Community Television. We're filming on location at Fountainhead Network in Port Coquitlam. And before we get started, I would just like to acknowledge with gratitude that our interview is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nation. And we thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to protect all the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. And today I'm joined by Nahid Ghani, who is going to talk to us about an issue that has um, been raised recently in Iran. So thank you so much for joining us today, Nahid. Thank you for having me. Hello. Well, um, I appreciate you coming to talk about this. And I was wondering if you could just share with us a little bit about your background, um, where you were born and how you happened to um, come to Canada. If we can just start with, with a little bit of background. Sure. Uh, I'm Nahid Ghani, as you introduced me, and I am an instructor here at VCC and um, an adjunct professor at New York Institute of Technology. I have a PhD in Iranian studies. I was born in Iran, and then I decided to um, immigrate to Canada. It was because our um, situation in Iran was a little different. We chose Canada because it provides a safe and fair environment for all, especially women. And uh, human rights are not a privilege. Uh, they are basic rights for everyone. So basically I'm here because I find it safe and fair to all. Okay, well, thank you for that. And that's something that I think is very important to Canadian values. Um, so it's nice to, to hear you say that as well. Can you tell us a little bit about Iran? Um, as far as being a woman in Iran, just give us a sense of, of what's that like and, and sort of day to day, some of maybe the challenges and, and some of the good things as well. Um, well, definitely the negatives outnumber positives, unfortunately, um, for all, especially for women. So I'm going to start with positive, and it could be a little bit different. Uh, I think compared to other Muslim uh, countries in the region, Iranian women have a little bit more freedom, and it is because uh, we had a Western modern uh, westernized modern life before the revolution in 1979. So is that with the Shah? Yes, that's yeah. right. So women had um, um, a lot of rights. Family law was good. Um, we were granted the right to vote 10 years earlier than Switzerland. So it is like really amazing. And that is why, you know, we were a little bit uh, we are a little bit uh, more f free, I would say, compared to, let's say, Saudi Arabian women. And now I'm going to start with the negatives because these are the challenges that we face uh, every day. Um, the first thing that I would like to mention is uh, the uh, women are considered as a property. So the guardian has the permission for, has to permit everything that the woman does. It is to do with, you know, travel. If a woman wants to travel outside Iran, they need the passport. So the father, uh, if the woman is not married, and when she's married, the husband has to go to a notary public and issue the uh, legal permit. So it's always order. a man who's the guardian of the woman. A woman, that's okay. right. And then uh, when the, if the uh, uh, woman wants to divorce, basically based on Sharia law, enforced by the government, enforced by the um, uh, state, they can't divorce if the husband is not willing to. So they have to wait for court to decide, and it can take years. Uh, the child's custody. Uh, the child's custody goes to the father, and in the absence of the father, it goes to the paternal grandfather. Um. And yeah, if the boy, if uh, the, the baby is a boy, then uh, he has to wait. Um, I mean, he stays with the mother for two years, and then the girl, baby girl, stays with the mother for seven years, and then they have to leave their mother and live with the uh, father. 
Okay, that puts women in a very difficult situation. Then. Exactly, mm. exactly. Can women, do women generally work outside of the home or go to university or are there restrictions around that as well? Uh, well, uh, if the parents want to, you know, stop them. I mean, fathers want to stop them. Yeah, they can. But usually that's not the case. So usually women are allowed to go to university, but then it is very much up to the husband to let the woman work outside. But, uh, well, uh, depending on um, the family culture, it might differ and it might be different from city to city, like in big cities, that might not be the issue, but in smaller cities, it might. It's a little more conservative in smaller. Exactly, yes. Uh, the next thing is um, if the woman is uh, injured um, or is killed, then the compensation money is half of the, you know, um, uh, what the what man gets. And if the man, if a man kills a woman, then the family of the woman has to pay their half, the half of the compensation money to the man so that the man is penalized. I mean, without that, that is not going to happen. Sorry, I just... Uh, yeah, it is a that, little bit confusing. Okay, if yeah. you could just kind of... Um, I'm not sure that I, I got that right. So if the man is killed? No, if the okay. man kills the, a woman, right. and well, of course, uh, the man is the criminal. Now, right. the wom the man has to be penalized, right? right? For the penalty, then the family of the woman has to pay half the money that, you know, the man is worth half the money hmm. of the com uh, compensation right, money. Right. So they have to pay this amount to the family of the man and the man gets penalized. Without that, the man can go without penalty. Okay, so the laws are quite different. What are the laws based on? Is it, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it is based on Sharia law okay. in Islam. Uh, Iran is a Shiite um, country. So uh, after the revolution, everything changed. As I told you, we had a good family uh, um, a law and then uh, it was totally different. Uh, based on Sharia law, mm -hmm. a girl can marry at the age of nine. So after the revolution, the age of marriage reduced to nine years old. It was 18. Wow. Does that happen? Our nine-year-old yes, we have child. Yes, we have child marriage in smaller, poorer areas. Right. It all comes from, you know, um, it, it is just because of the poverty, basically. Right. right. So a city would be quite different than a small yes. town. Yes, small exactly. Village. Exactly. Right. Okay, that's, that's quite... Um, shocking. Shocking, yes. And I know we hear about things on the news and stuff, but Iran seems so far away sometimes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, the hijab law and, you know, uh, rules around how women are dressed? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, as I told you, a woman is uh, worth half of a man when it comes to injury or life. Right. Uh, the other thing is that the woman's testimony is, again, half the weight of, the, of a man. So you see, like, everything is controlled by Sharia law. So everything's weighted in favor of the man. The man, yeah, that's right. And um, women in Iran, based on Sharia law, have to cover themselves from head to toe, except their hands, their feet, and their face. Right. Uh, but the government calls it a, the desirable hijab, which is wearing a chador. If I want to compare it with anything, it's a nun's uh, habit, like a nun's habit. So it's okay. a piece of long cloth, and then uh, women put on their head, and it's going to cover everything over their tunic and pants. Right. So this is like the desirable hijab. However, we have like different kinds of hijab. So. Uh, Basically, it is tunic, a long tunic, pants, and a scarf. So your face would be still exposed? Exactly, yes. Okay. And um, that's something that's worn outside of the home only? Yes, outside okay. home, right. Again, depending on how conservative and religious a, a family would be, because we have like uh, this Islamic rule that if you are around your father, brother, husband, uncle, 
you are okay not to wear hijab but other than that right. like around your cousins they are not allowed to see you without hijab so you've got to cover yourself so if you're outside you automatically need to wear your exactly hijab. And then we have uh, this kind of police called morality police, but then it has nothing to do with morality. It is all to do with hijab. So let's oh. call it hijab police. Okay. And then uh, it is very much decided on their discretion because there are women, uh, they follow the dress code to the letter, still they are stopped by the hijab police arrested, sometimes dragged to the police vans, they are taken to custody, they are uh, trialed, they are flogged, and it's going to be, you know, because of social media, it is something totally different from maybe our days. Uh, sometimes we see horrendous pictures of women, uh, their back, their body bruised because they were flogged. So, and that's regardless of wearing the attire correctly they're just it could be you know oh you wear a little bit of makeup or mm -hmm. your scarf is not uh, properly right. um, around your head or you suddenly you know we feel that you are uh, too westernized in terms of you know okay. clothing so it could be anything because I have seen many examples on social media uh, girls and women said that okay I was on my way to work and I was stopped and I was arrested mm -hmm. and there's no sort of way to appeal that I, I, is there like if you were taken by the hijab police um, what happens can you appeal that or reach out to your family and and is there something yeah that that's can be a done? very good question so um, basically what happens is that the girls are taken to the van sometimes their cell phones are taken away from them sometimes not again as I said it is really discretionary mm -hmm. and then they are uh, they reach out to family but then usually they have to stay a night or two in this special center called detention specialized center for hijab and it is on a um, very trendy part of Tehran I mean streets um, so they reach out to their family. Their family have to come and then, you know, um, mm -hmm. bail uh, in order to release them. Right, and that's traumatizing. Like, Very. if you don't know when you might be targeted and picked up, like, it, it does sort of um, create an a atmosphere of, of fear. Exactly, I, I totally agree with you. You know, these police, um, these hijab police uh, people are... Uh, they have a special uh, appearance and character. Let me give you an example. Most of them um, have a beard and um, they can be really fierce looking mm -hmm. if they are men. You can't believe when I arrived here in Canada one day, uh, it was just maybe the first year or the first few months, I walked into the printing room and I saw this man, the same looking man, and I was taken aback and I literally took one step back. You're, you've been traumatized. I was traumatized because yes. we had this problem mm. in Iran. I am a teacher. I have always been a teacher. Even in Iran, I was a teacher. We had the segregation in classes. So I was teaching in a private school. I was teaching uh, university girls and boys who wanted to come here or other countries to okay. further their education. And then we had uh, the let's say commercial kind of police coming checking to see oh uh, the, uh, the the uh, there is co-education let's call it co-education co boys and girls are sitting together why and it was kind of you know traumatizing for us I was 14 years old mm -hmm. and I had nail polish you know a kid and I was seeing these you know special police cars at the time and I was so frightened that I had to have my uh, fist tight not right. showing my you know oh, nail polish right. okay yeah I have never been arrested so that's one thing but then it can happen you know and you know again another uh, example I was arrested with my husband at the time we were not married we were stopped and then they said what is the relationship oh, between you? so it's not your father or your brother or your uncle. Yeah, oh. and, and then I said, okay, uh, 
that's my fiance. Well, that it okay? was not. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they had to call my mom and, you know, double check. So you see, women are controlled. Yes, yes. Every aspect of our lives, even, you know, boys, you know, boys can be controlled as well. Well, women, obviously more, but then... Mm -hmm. But the boys, it sounds like they're brought up in this system where that's normal for them. Uh, not necessarily. Yes, there are a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of, we have a spectrum, you know, of kind of, you know, upbringing in Iran. For me and for my family, for my husband's family, it wasn't normal. Oh, okay. So there's people there that aren't like part of, the, that you... Um, are sort of hoping or, or, or living by a different set of rules that you would like to see, but you're, these are being imposed. So exactly, it's, okay. imposed yes. by the uh, government. So right. that's one thing. Um, so I would say that the, that women in Iran are under a lot of pressure. Yes. So when you say traumatized, I really can identify with that. Well, and starting from nine years old. So when you're in that, you're just very much developing your personality and your confidence, your self-esteem. Um, and to be put under that sort of scrutiny from that early age is, I mean, that's that's difficult situation. Very difficult, yeah. Even, you know, at schools. Mm -hmm. I remember I was... Well, children, you know, kids, they want to be happy, they dance, they laugh out loud. I remember that we had, again, discretionary, you know, um, verdicts, I could say. Right. They were uh, controlling us. Why are you laughing out loud? Why your hair is shown? Well, we were in an all-school, all-girls school. So how come? But, you know, as you said, we are traumatized. Right. And... Um, it is not just for women, I would say, it is for the kids. Kids, women, men. Now we are all suffering. Right. Well, there was um, a recent incident that really made worldwide news and um, we're still feeling the repercussions of that. And it was um, Masa Amini, who um, was a young woman who was picked up by the hijab police and um, she was taken into custody and she died. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, sure. What, what you think happened or a little bit around that story? Yeah, Masa, well, this is really heartbreaking. Masa Amini uh, was a girl from Saqiz, Kurdistan province. Uh, she came to the capital city to visit her brother, her younger brother. They were stopped at the uh, uh, subway station by the hijab police. Um, it is really heartbreaking when I remember uh, what her brother said. Her brother said, please don't take Masa with you. Don't take my mm. sister. We are new in this city. We don't know anyone. And well, you know, it is lost in translation. If I just want to, you know, tell you how it feels like to hear that word in Farsi, that is going to be really something, something really, you know, that stays with you for the rest of your life. It's going to be haunting. Anyway, so uh, the brother uh, implored the hijab police, don't take my sister. They took Mahsa. According to a witness, she was insulted and beaten in the van. And then uh, when she arrived uh, there, she started to lose vision and fainted. Mm -hmm. The thing is that if Mahsa was on her own and her brother was not accompanying her, then we wouldn't know what she happened. She would have disappeared yeah. and nobody would know. Exactly. No one would know. Wow. And we wouldn't have this, you know, type of uh, awareness around, you know. Well, you the, wonder... I mean, we would have, but then the protests, you know. Right. Yeah. And you wonder how many times that has happened to young women. Many times. Yes. Many oh. times. Well. And there have been a lot of protests worldwide. There's been protests here in Vancouver. Um, and those have also had consequences in Iran, the protests. Can you talk a little bit about what the consequences have been for the protesters in Iran who have stood up and said this isn't acceptable? Well, uh, yeah, that, the, you know what, this hijab thing going on for the past 43 years, and because we tasted modern life, right. Western life. We have like this collective memory from before revolution. So 
uh, the young generation are not really unfamiliar to this. So they have access to social media, to internet, to books and everything. And so they don't believe the regime propaganda. Uh, so there's full access to Facebook and social media not, and that no, sort of thing? The, they are blocked. So okay. with a VPN they can, but then still people can access, people okay. see things, can educate themselves. And um, it has been an ongoing thing against hijab and uh, against women's oppression in Iran for a long time. Um, what happened to Massa was uh, maybe the last straw. Mm -hmm. Because we have had these, you know, um, uh, protests in the past few years. Um, it has started from after, you know, uh, let me just, you know, rephrase it. When the revolution in 1979 happened, oppression of women started with it. They wanted to control women, their body, their life, and every aspect of everybody's life. So after a month or so, after one month, women took to the street and then they were against hijab. They wanted freedom. Right. But then more oppression came. Two months after revolution, uh, our minister at the time, I mean, uh, 1979 uh, uh, education uh, uh, minister was a woman called uh, Farrokh Ruparsa. She was in custody, she was arrested, and the judge at the time, a cleric, a brutal cleric, I can identify, uh, I can, you know, relate him, compare him with Eichmann in uh, oh, wow. Nazi Germany. Yes. Yeah, he sentenced a lot of people to death executed this woman because he thought promiscuity by her was promoted at school because the education system was westernized right. was modern right oh so she was yeah she was so uh things against women fight against women women's body women's choice of you know life started just at that after revolution just the day after the uh, right. revolution so women are still fighting, still still fighting to yeah. gain that freedom. Yeah, and yeah. they these you know things just added up. Now today we are you know at a big revolution across the country. Young people, teenagers take to the street. They they are all grassroots um, protests. Uh, every community, every district, every county have their own you know group of young people. They come to the street and then they fight barehanded. Unfortunately, a lot of them have been killed. Yes. In September, a city, a very a small city in um, Sistan and Baluchistan. Um, it, it, Sistan and Baluchistan is a southeastern province in Iran. Um, in one of the cities, a 15-year-old girl was raped by a commander in chief. Oh. It happened maybe two, three months ago. And in September, right at the beginning of the protest um, for Mahsa, people in Zahedan, after Friday prayer, took to the street, they chanted against the uh, you know, commander in chief. They wanted justice. So people knew what happened. It everybody knows. Knowledge. Yes, everybody knew. We all know. Then the regime um, forces opened fire at people, civilians. Oh, so ninety-three that's kids were killed. Oh, that's the biggest kind of oppression, I'm, and that sends such a signal throughout the country. Like, do not protest. Like, there yeah, will be exactly. consequences. Yeah, and there are a lot of teenagers, a lot of kids, wow. are killed, and it is really heart wrenching when you look at the, you know pictures, how they died. Sometimes, you know, we see uh, footages from their last moments. Oh, that's heartbreaking. Very. Heartbreaking. Um, you know, we do, some of that does filter out and we see probably not near what's happening. What can we do here in Canada? How can we support the people of Iran and the women of Iran? Well, the the revolution started with the most beautiful slogan, woman, life, freedom. Mm -hmm. And people want the support, all the Iranians, regardless of their gender, their faith, their ethnicity, 
all of them. Because on the front line, there aren't only women and girls, there are men. There are okay. boys, like boys who are 15 years old, 16 years old. They should be in, uh, in schools. Uh, we want the support for the kids that are called to the intelligence service because at school they chanted against the regime. The principal calls the uh, forces to come and arrest them. Can you imagine? I can't imagine. It's it's so foreign so to that kind of mindset or, or that that could happen to your child. Exactly. You know, I just... And then there are some principals mm. who do that. And then on the other hand, we have some principals who are really conscientious and they are like really human. And then they stop, you know, the forces. They don't let them in. Right. But these things happen. And what we need is the worldwide support. We want the world to know what is happening. We want the West to stop dealing with the regime. Okay. We want, uh, you know, Prime, Min Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has uh, listed IRGC, only 10,000 uh, officials, um, listed them as a terrorist uh, entity, en entity. That is good, but not enough. Okay. We are thankful to him, but it is not enough. So we as people need to be pushing our government to exactly. take action. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That's the point. Uh, we want the Canadians to force, to push, to pressure the government, because what is happening is that the IRGC is uh, I mean, the sanction of the IRGC has fallen under immigration law rather than criminal act. Put the whole IRGC as uh, under, you know, this list, mm -hmm. terrorist entity, because we have a lot of agents here. Mm -hmm. We don't have an embassy here in, in, in right, Canada. We don't have diplomatic relations. It's why, why mm -hmm. it happened, because 10 years ago, after a series of all these provocation, you know, Zahra Kazemi, you most probably heard of, uh, who was um, just like Mahsa Amini, was killed in the custody, yes. was murdered in the custody. Uh, it, is, it is because, you know, the Iranian ambassador here said that we want our people here to go and kind of infiltrate in every section, media, university, even, you know, governmental sections, we want forces, we want to recruit them. So this was the last straw. Right. And that was when, you know, the embassy was closed. So we want more than this. It was a good, you know, step. Right. And it is because we have a lot of affiliates, the regime affiliates here in Canada. So, Nahid, we're, our time is almost up, but I was wondering, is there any, anything else that you would like us to know just before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. This government um, in Iran and the IRGC can be compared with the infamous uh, Gestapo, SS in um, Ger uh, Nazi Germany. So we want the world to know, and especially Canada, to sanction them, to stop them from coming here, to uh, r identify who does what in this country because it is IR, the IRGC is not just a military uh, entity. It has all its tentacles in economy, military, and ideology everywhere. Right. So support. Support us with, you know, listing the IRGC and everyone who's affiliated here in Canada as terrorists. Well, Thank you so much. You've um, given us quite an education and a, an insight into what the situation is in Iran and also how we as Canadian citizens can stand up and speak out to Iran and by approaching our own government um, and pushing them to take the right actions. So I really appreciate you coming and having what is a little bit of a difficult conversation. I know it's, um, you know, we would love to see things change but um, I appreciate you being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, we really hope uh, that the people around the world listen to us and listen to the voiceless. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you so much for listening. This is Tri-Cities Community Television, and we were talking to Nahid Ghani about the situation in Iran.